Good morning out there. Wonderful to see you. We welcome you to All Nations Church this morning. Thank you for being with us. Please go ahead and stand. We're going to sing a song together. Raise our voices as one with the song, My Hallelujah. As praise goes up, I believe the walls are coming down. When I was lost, you rescued me. When I was bound, you set me free. As praise goes up, I believe the walls are coming down. You are my strength. As praise goes up, I believe the walls are coming down. When I was lost, you rescued me. When I was bound, you set me free. As praise goes up, I believe the walls are coming down. The walls are coming down.
grace and peace to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And welcome to worship at All Nations Church on uh, what we've been talking earlier. It feels like a, a summery day. It's good to be here. Uh, sun is shining and welcome. Uh, especially if you are new, um, if you've just recently come to Luxembourg or just recently come to our church, we especially welcome you. We we'll invite you, if you'd like, to stop at the table in the back. Uh, you can share some of your information with us if you'd like, but you can also, even better, uh, get directly connected to our weekly update and also uh, to the Church Center app, which you may have heard us talk about sometimes but might not be familiar with that. But just to say, uh, if you don't have that, uh, you can find it. You don't have to be on the app. You can be online. You've probably been there without knowing it. But if you're looking for a small group, if you're looking for a place to serve, or if you're looking just uh, for what's happening in the church, that's really uh, the best place to get connected. So if you don't have that, uh, you can easily download it. We have a little uh, QR code in the back. You can do that. If you've never done it, uh, maybe today's the day. One thing uh, to know is we're not having children's ministry uh, this week or next. It's the, the school break, so we're not uh, able to do that. Many of our teachers are away. So uh, children are always welcome with us. Uh, if they make a joyful noise, that's great. Um, we are having a nursery crash uh, both of those Sundays, so today and next Sunday as well. That's uh, children up to three are welcome in the back. They're probably already there, but in case not, uh, they are welcome there. Also to know, we are not having uh, the live stream today, again, because many of our volunteers are away. So you're here, so that's probably not uh, a big thing, but if you go looking for the service uh, online, we, we won't have it. However, we will have the audio of the service uh, up soon, so you, uh, if you want to re-listen to something, you can find it there. Uh, one thing happening this uh, Thursday, in fact, is the All Together concert. This is uh, something that many folks in our church are participating in, including uh, Teresia and Dave and, and others who are joining this choir to sing. And th this is not a, a Christian group exactly. However, they are gathering to sing very Christian songs in, uh, in public settings. So it's, it's kind of an exciting, unusual thing that you can uh, go enjoy. So one opportunity upcoming is uh, this Thursday at the uh, castle in Kurik. I hope I'm saying that more or less correctly. Uh, that's at uh, 7 p.m. Uh, there's more information about that in the weekly updates uh, as well. And also um, on the 6th of July at noon uh, down in the, the Kinnicksvix Park, there'll be a, a big stage, 250 people singing on that Saturday. So maybe go ahead and put those dates on your calendar. Uh, it's an exciting thing just to go hear public uh, gospel songs being sung. I'm gonna invite uh, Paul up to give a, uh, a kind of announcement we don't give every day. Um, so uh, as you all know, uh, due to Logan's <coughs> um, leaving the AMTL to start a new church here at the end of June, the governing board has decided that in the interim time we wanna hire a pastoral assistant to be able to help take on some of the really valuable and important things that Logan does that we don't, we don't have someone easily to slot into and to pull into that. Um, so those would include things like the communication, uh, which is one of those things is a weekly update that you get that tells you what's going on, but that's just one of the many things that, that uh, will be there. But also for the welcome and connection ministries, for the assimilation, helping people in that kind of back office process of, of, of helping people get connected to the church, find out what's going on, making sure that they're, they're welcome, not just on Sunday, but in the process as they're here. Um, so this, temp, this uh, um, job, this role will be temporary. Uh, we expect six months. Uh, if, depending on if we don't have a new associate pastor, then it will probably extend beyond that. And it will be a paid 15 hour a week uh, role. So we want you to know about it. Um, we put the job up on Adam. And uh, so that's the Luxembourgish uh, employment agency here. Uh, and in, next week it'll be in the weekly update. And you'll see in that the role description, the qualifications, and how, to, uh, how you can apply. So we just want you to be aware. You might be one of the per persons that would like to look into that role and to see if that's for you. Uh, but we also just wanna say thank you for praying uh, during this transition for, for the church here, but also for Logan uh, and for the church that is starting uh, and that transition we want to see both uh, flourish. And also for those that are, you may, you may be here and you've kind of been involved a little bit, maybe were involved in the past and you've kind of taken a break and you're kind of saying, hey, you know, I think I need to step up because there's a, there's a kind of void here and there's an opportunity for me to really re-engage. And I hope that if that happens, that you'll take the opportunity to support one another and to do the will of God here. So thanks, Logan. 
Yeah, Paul just mentioned the Welcome and Connections Ministry, which is a huge ministry that uh, has something like 80 people in it. You know, this is uh, everything from the, the greeters and the hosts, the, the ushers, the offering collectors, uh, those who make coffee. And in two weeks, uh, two weeks from today, we're going to have a, um, like a celebration lunch for all of those people. Uh, J Joseph Ramesh and some of our other Indian friends are going to make some Indian food, so it should be very good. I'm telling you that because many of you are part of that ministry. I just want to let you uh, very much know that you are invited and also uh, because they are happy to make lots of food. We are going to make lots of food, meaning um, that uh, families are invited as well, uh, families of people who are part of that ministry. So if you feel like in the past, like, I haven't been able to come to something because what does my family do? Well, your family is welcome to come and I think we may end up with a lot of people and a lot of food and we'll just have a good time and celebrate uh, that ministry together. So please sign up for that was my last uh, thing. Sign up for that so we know how many to cook for. Um, we are again looking at Christian essentials today, and today the essential, uh, it, well, it's so essential, it's the very essence of God. God is love, uh, and we are looking at love today. I invite you to stand as we continue to worship and to hear these words from Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your great name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and his compassion is over all that he has made. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever.
point, I invite you, you can please go ahead and be seated. The ushers will be coming forward to uh, receive the offering. Uh, as there's no children's ministry, uh, the kids will not be leaving. pray. God, who is love, whose being is love, whose essence is love, who cannot not love, we thank you that in all ways and everything that you are love to us. We exist because of your love. We are redeemed through your love, and we will live forever through your love. We thank you that you have made us <clears throat> in your image to share this love that you are, that we might be partakers of it, that we might love you and love one another. 
We confess, though, that so often we find it difficult to love, or rather, we love ourselves in a way that makes it impossible for us to love you and others. We confess that contrary to what the scriptures say, which we will hear, that, that we are so often arrogant and rude and boastful, that we seek our own benefit and disregard that of others, that maybe very pointedly we, we do keep record of wrongs, we do keep score in relationship. Lord, we, we pray that you might free us from this way of being, that, that we might not believe that our, our good comes through uh, seeking our own good, but actually through loving others as you have first loved us. It is by giving ourselves away, even as you give yourself away on the cross, that we actually find what it is that we need. We pray that you would simply help us as you command us in scripture to love you and to love one another. We pray that we would be people who look not only to our own interests, but look first and foremost to the interests of others, just as Christ himself did, who humbled himself and served. We pray that we would be these kind of people and we would be this kind of church that when, when people speak of All Nations Church, they would say those are people who love one another. Those are people who serve one another. Lord, we pray for all those who either find it difficult to love or, or feel like they cannot be loved. We pray for those who are seeking a relationship or longing to be loved and don't feel like anyone does or can, and so therefore also don't feel like you love them, God. May they find the love for which they were made. We pray for all those people who are in relationship, who, are, who have made even commitments to, to love uh, until death do us part, and who, who find that very difficult, who, who find themselves uh, feeling estranged or in conflict or very much keeping a record of those wrongs in a way that leads not to life but to death. Lord, we pray that you would teach us to love, that we could, again, as Christ, lay down ourselves and find life in it. We pray for all those who are so hurt and broken, who have, who have been um, really hurt by others in, in such a way that it makes it difficult to love. Lord, may they find healing. May they find uh, forgiveness and restoration such that they can love as you have called them to love, that they may know your love, that they might be able to forgive and therefore find forgiveness. Lord, we also confess that even when we want to love, that we, we don't know what it means to love. We, even when we mean well, we may not choose well. Uh, for all parents who are seeking, what, what does it mean to love my children? What does it mean to be a good parent, Lord? Give us wisdom and discernment. For all those who are in jobs where it's kind of morally confusing, what would it mean to, to love the people I manage? What would it mean to love my boss? Lord, give us that wisdom. What would it mean to be like Christ in this situation? In all of our relationships, Lord, help us to see clearly what your love does to that situation and therefore what it, it allows us to be in that situation. May we love you. May we love our neighbors. We pray this through Christ who loves us. Amen. Thank you, Logan. Scripture reading today is taken from the book of Matthew and 1 Corinthians. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees with his reply, they met together to question him again. One of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with this question. Teacher, 
which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Here now we read from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm sure you've heard this many times. It never, it never gets old. If I could speak in the language, all the languages of the earth and the all th angels, but did not love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I had to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless. But love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But when we see, but when we will see everything with perfect clarity, all that I know now is partially incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God knows me completely. Three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. We have a real treat today um, that uh, Julia Kennedy is going to come bring us the, the message today, the sermon. Um, Julia and Simon, many of you know, some of you uh, don't, if you're newer, uh, have been a vital part of All Nations Church. Uh, they, were on, they led small groups, a small group. Uh, for many years while they were here, and they also uh, were vital parts of the worship team. And uh, uh, also Simon was one who led our uh, youth ministry during their time here. So, and I want you to know, even though if you look at them and you don't think so, they're fat. All right? They're faithful, available, teachable, and team players. Faithful to God and to other people. They're available to God and to others. They're teachable, willing to learn from God, but also willing to learn from other people. And they are people who work together as teams. And God uses fat people. Always has, always will. So although they look really skinny, they're pretty fat. <laughs> Simon and Julia now work with Youth for a Mission in Lausanne, Switzerland. And I like to think of them as on assignment from All Nations Church, even though that's not exactly the truth. But uh, they belong to God, not belong to us. But we're really privileged to have Julia come and bring the message for us today. Julia. Well, thank you, Paul. Thank you for your very kind words. Um, it's great to be here again. It's great to be back in Luxembourg this weekend. 
Um, when we meet pe new people, we always talk about our homes being in Scotland and in Luxembourg and in Switzerland, and we really mean it. So it's good to be home this weekend, and it's great especially to be with our ANCL family here. Um, as Paul said, we've been serving with um, Youth with a Mission, YWAM, in Switzerland for now just over a year. Um, and some of you get our regular or fairly regular updates. So you'll know what's been happening with us and what we've been up to. And we really appreciate your prayers and your ongoing support. Um, and as we said in our last updates, it's been quite, it's been quite a year. <laughs> it's been, um, it's, there's been a lot of change. Some of those changes challenging. Some of those changes absolutely amazing. Um, but what's been consistently just beautiful through that whole time, that whole period that we've been there is just to see how God is moving in the lives of young people in Europe. You know, um, God is alive, he is working, he is transforming lives right in front of our eyes. And we get the, the pleasure and the privilege of, of being a part of that and of seeing that on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we have students coming through our doors from all walks of lives and cultures, and they're taking time out to, to figure out their faith, to grow in their relationship with God and in, in his word. And, you know, in, in every school we see students, many of them, impacted by, by God in that time. We see them understand, what does it mean really for me to be a follower of Jesus? Um, what does God's word really mean? Like the, the difficult, tricky bits and the nice you know, the nice bits that we just read. Um, what does that mean for me and how does that affect how I'm going to live my life? Um, and so thank you for your prayers and your support. Thank you for being a part of that ministry in Switzerland. You know, as I say, we get the, the privilege and the, the pleasure of seeing that, you know, day to day in front of our eyes. So we just want to encourage you um, and, and thank you for being a part of that too. So... Um, as we know, in the series of Christian Essentials, this week, week we come to the theme of, of love, and it's not a small topic. The Bible has got quite a lot to say about it. Um, depending on the translation or the version of the Bible that you use, the word love can appear anything between 500 and 800 times. So I'm glad that when Paul um, gave me the sermon topic, he also narrowed it down to the two passages that, that John just read for us. And, and as he said, they're familiar to, to many of us and they're read the world over. Um, but cutting through the familiarity or trying to cut through that familiarity, there is, there's so much to discover in those two passages about what love is, about how we love and why we should love. Like, why is it in this series of Christian essentials? So let's um, start by looking at the, that beautiful passage in 1 Corinthians. Um, that whole letter of Corinthians is Paul writing to the church on a whole variety of issues that are affecting church life. And excuse me, in chapter 14 and in chapter 12 and chapter 14, sort of either side of the passage we just read, Paul gives some really detailed teaching and instructions on the spiritual gifts. So including prophecy, teaching, speaking in tongues, serving each other. And it seems that the Corinthians had kind of rather lost sight or they'd, they'd misunderstood the importance of all of these gifts and the way that all of those gifts that different people have all need to work together in a way to complement each other um, to allow the church to function really healthily. Instead, the Corinthians were elevating some gifts and considering them more important than others. And this was creating all sorts of division and bad feeling and uh, disorder in the church. And so chapter 13, in the middle of all of that, comes like a bit of a time out. It's as if Paul is saying, okay, let's just pause, take a breath, and let's just think about this another way. There's actually a framework within which you can put everything I've just said in chapter 12 and everything I'm about to say in chapter 14. You can actually just put it into this framework, and that framework is love. And if you do everything within that framework of love, then you're gonna be heading in the right track. But outside of that framework, everything that you're doing might be, might look and it might feel really quite admirable and impressive. I mean, singing and speaking in tongues and um, prophesying, giving to the poor, faith to believe for miracles. Um, and in fact, you could have been doing some of these things, you know, to the 
to, the, to perfection. You could be sounding like angels. You could be giving away everything that you have to, to help the poor. But if love is missing, then really you're missing the whole point. You're not really having the impact that you could or you should have. It's not that Paul's saying that what we do in church and as church, all that goes on here is not important. The activity is important. You know, God gives us all of these things in order to allow the church to function well. Um, but Paul's saying that love needs to be the motivating force for all that the church does. And love needs to be carried and contained in everything that goes on in church life. And the word love that Paul refers to here has got far more depth and meaning than the English words that we use love. I mean, I would say that I love coffee and I love Simon, um, but my connection and my affection for Americanos with a splash of milk is very different from my connection and affection towards the man I've committed to spend my whole life with. That's 24 years and counting. Um, the, the, word that, the word love that Paul uses here is the Greek word agape. It's the same word that Jesus used to describe the love that he had for his disciples and the love that Jesus wants his disciples to have for one another. You might recall Jesus serving his disciples by washing their feet at supper, and he gave them this instruction to love one another as I have loved you. So we understand this word love, agape, by looking at the way Jesus was, and we see in him kindness and compassion and sacrifice. The agape that we see in Jesus is outward looking, it's other people focused, it's giving of yourself, Jesus ultimately giving him his life on the cross. It's giving ourselves for the good of the other person and expecting nothing and demanding nothing in return. And in fact, Jesus even knew that as he was giving that what he was doing was going to be rejected by others. And we compare that with how we see and how we think of the word love today. So often, actually, we love something because it makes us feel good, because it satisfies some kind of need that we have, whether that's for affirmation or company or understanding or distraction. Now, this love that Paul is talking about, that Jesus talked about, is a love that gives. And in the passage, Paul is appealing for love specifically in the context of a church. But if this is really the greatest way to live, and if this is something that Jesus has commanded, then I think we apply what we read in 1 Corinthians to the whole of life, to any walk of life, be that marriage, um, work situations, yes, church communities, but our neighborhoods, our cities, and our nations. And Paul really helps us out here by painting um, a picture of what love looks like. So let's just have a look at, at that, uh, that now. There's two things that love is. It's patient and it's kind. So it has time for people. It allows time for people to do things, to say things. It gives time for people to change. Love is kind. It's affectionate, it's pleasant, it's welcoming, and it's hospitable. And then there is a list of eight things that love is not. And as we think about these, you see that they're all very sort of inward-looking, self-focused qualities. Love isn't jealous. It doesn't look at the blessings in someone else's life and think, why don't I have that? Or why can't I have that? Instead, it manages to celebrate the good things that happen to other people. The promotion, the nice job, the well-behaved children, the nice vacation, or the answers to prayer. It's not boastful, it's not always talking about, I'm not always talking about myself, my ambitions, my achievements, but take a genuine interest in what's going on in other people's lives. It's not proud, thinking I'm better or I know better than others around me. It's not unteachable or inflexible, you might say. It's not rude, it doesn't ignore or disregard or fail to pay attention to other people. It doesn't demand its own way. It's not always forcing my own interests, my agenda, my time skills, putting me above everybody else consistently, but it's prepared to compromise. It's not irritable. Sounds like a small thing, but it's not irritable. It doesn't get frustrated or annoyed at people or things not being the way that I want them to be. And that irritation often 
yeah, we, we think we can hold it inside our hearts, but so much more, so much more often than that, it spills out into the, uh, uh, to the people around us. Love keeps no record of wrongs. As Logan was praying, you know, forgiveness is a core attribute of love. It doesn't bring up the time that someone's messed up or the number of times that someone's messed up in the past. Um, God doesn't hold our wrongs against us, so we don't have a right to do that for, against others. Love does not rejoice about injustice. I mean, we all think that we have a very fair, good sense of justice, but I think what this is really getting at is that it doesn't take any delight or pleasant sort of satisfaction at anybody else's wrongdoing. You know, that kind of silent satisfaction in your heart that says, oh, I always knew there was something about them. I knew that sooner or later this was going to happen. That's not what love does. It doesn't gossip about the faults or the shortcomings of other people. And then the flip side of that, it rejoices when truth wins out. So when sin or lies are exposed in anybody else's life or in my life, then it rejoices that there's an opportunity for Jesus to come and to bring his healing and his redemption into that situation. So that's what love isn't. And then there's a collection of always and never statements. So love never gives up in the sense that it never gives up on anyone. It bears any, everyone and, and everything. It doesn't like to see faults in other people and it doesn't let those faults keep us from, from being available to other people. Love never loses faith. It believes in all things. It believes the best in others. It, does, it's not, it doesn't have that resting state of suspicion against other people. The English preacher um, Charles Spurgeon referred to this as having a blind eye to the faults of other people and a bright eye uh, to excellence. So it's about seeing the good wherever that exists in other people, pointing to the good things and believing that God has redeeming power to change what needs to be changed. Um, Spurgeon also encouraged his congregation to keep exaggerating the virtues of other people. We, don't, we can't go wrong when we encourage and we bless and we see and we talk about the good things that we see in other people. Love is always <clears throat> hopeful. It's never despairing or pessimistic, always believing in good things to come in my own life, in the life of others, in the world. And love endures through every circumstance. This is the time factor of love. God himself is love. God is eternal. Love endures forever. And so I don't know if, if like me, you, you hear that and you're thinking to yourself, well, yikes, I mean, the world looks nothing like that, of course. But then looking a little bit closer to home, to be perfectly honest, if I think about my day-to-day -day life, there are probably tens, if not hundreds of times a day when my attitude and my actions are nothing like that. So is this a wildly unrealistic expectation of Paul, or can this actually become a reality for us? Well, I think that the key to that is revealed by Jesus in the passage we read in Matthew, where the religious leaders have come to Jesus and asked him, what's the most important commandment? They're not really so much interested in the answer, but they're trying to trick him into saying that something's not important so that they can then um, uh, discredit him for that. But Jesus comes back with a brilliant answer by saying that love is the greatest and the highest thing to pursue in life. It's love that actually holds all of the other commandments and the teachings together, and that's love that gives them meaning and purpose. And you'll notice how similar that is to what Paul has said about the relationship between uh, love and all that goes on in church life. It's that same thing. Love holds it all together. Love is the framework. And Jesus' response to what is the greatest commandment is to reply, well, these two are the greatest commandment, loving God a commandment drawn from Deuteronomy, and loving your neighbor from the laws in Leviticus. So in the words of Jesus, the outward expression of love, one human being to another human being, is completely linked. It's not higher or lower, and it's not separate from loving God. And that command to love God is, as I say, from the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, and it was part of a, a daily prayer known as the Shema, which is recited in, in Jewish tradition since the time of Moses. And so those who heard Jesus, um, the, that heard Jesus' reply would have been really familiar with what he was talking about. But for those of us not from that tradition, we need to break it down a bit to understand what is, that, what is Jesus actually saying here? And when Jesus is talking about loving God, the word love here is 
are Hebrew words, I'm not going to say this correctly probably, but ahava. And it means affection or care, respect and loyalty. So that love for God is not a sort of sentimental feeling, but it looks like something. It implies a giving of something, a giving of time and attention. It implies behavior that is trusting and faithful to God's ways. But it's also more than just simply obedience because, you know, the Pharisees were perfect at keeping God's law, but Jesus didn't see God's love in them. And so it's affection and it's care, it's respect and it's loyalty with all of your heart. And the Hebrew word there is lev, which was understood to be, yes, where you feel things, you feel things in your heart, but also where your inclinations and your desires are. And so in that way, the heart is the kind of the center of your, your will. It's the center of your decision making. You don't just think to do something in your head. You, you resolve to do something in your heart or you go with something because your heart is telling you to. So loving God with our heart means leaning towards him and making decisions in our lives that show affection, that show care and respect to him and for his desires for our life. It's choosing to put his ways and desires above our own. Loving God with all of our soul. The Hebrew word there is nefesh, which means your throat. So it's, it's where you take in food and where you take in air. And so it's, it's everything that you need to survive. And so that word soul is really meant to be, you know, your entire human existence, your body, your heart, your mind, your emotions, your will, your desires. Loving God with all of your mind. It's interesting, actually, that Jesus, um, Jesus used the word mind, but the, the original Hebrew doesn't talk about your mind. It, there was no word in Hebrew for brain or, or, or mind in that same way. But Jesus added the word mind because he was speaking to a, a Roman audience, which was, which was um, yeah, an, an audience under, under Roman culture that sort of understood that concept of, of thinking up here in your, in your head or in your brain. So, so loving God with your mind is about bringing our thoughts to focus on the truth of who God is and what he says. It's what Paul, what, um, Paul talks about in Colossians, about setting our minds on the realities of heaven. The reality that there's more than just the world around us, that, that we um, and the world exist in God and for God. It's applying our minds to God's word, not just reading it, but studying it, meditating on it, considering its meaning, and how it affects us and the world and others around us. So for example, I was reading the other morning in, in Psalm, 20, no, Psalm 37 that we're not to be anxious about those who do evil in the world. And, and I really need to, I'm still in that process of, of thinking, what does that actually mean? I mean, in this world, there is a lot of, we can point to a lot of evil going on, wars and, and famine and, and um, division and persecution. So what's God actually saying there when I was saying don't be anxious about the evil in the world? Is there something about my, in my perspective of the world and how I approach it, how I pray for things that means that has to be changed by that? I don't have the answer, but that's applying our minds to what God's word says. What does it actually mean here and now? It's allowing him and not others to guide our thoughts and in that process learning to think like him. And as a side note, the original Hebrew also contained the word um, loving God with all of our strength, meaning like everything that we have, all of our capabilities and our capacities, um, everything that we have, like our time and our money and our gifts and our skills, loving God with all of that, showing him affection and care with all of that. So this is what the, the first element of the greatest command, the most important way of life is. It's to live a life of devotion, giving full attention and respect to the words and the ways of God. And where that appears, where that command appears in the scriptures, in the Old Testament, it was clear that this command to love God comes because of and in response to the love that God already has and is pouring out on his people. That existing, everlasting, constant and immovable love of God for his people. It's what, loving God is what we do in response to a God who is already loving and giving towards us. And it's only from this first element of loving God that the second element of the greatest commandment, loving others, loving others as ourselves, will flow. And that's what we read about um, in 1 Corinthians 2. 
And so, yes, we are loved by God. We are loved by God. That's a fact. That's a given. Um, but how do we grow from going from people who are loved by God into people whose lives are completely absorbed by the love of God, that we, we have it, we contain it, and we give it away? How do we move, move into that? Well, we don't get there simply by knowing that we should or by kind of hoping that someday it's just miraculously going to happen. It's going to take some effort on our part. Um, it's not something we necessarily feel like doing, but it's a choice to set our attention and our affection, our hearts, our minds, and our souls on him and on his ways. And we see Jesus do this in the way that he knew the scriptures and how they applied to his life. He prayed, he spent time alone with God, away from the busyness and the materiality of, world, of the world. He fasted and he made choices to serve others even when it hurt him or cost him. So if this is what Jesus did to love God and to feel his ministry and his love for others, then why would it be any different from us? for us? Jesus says to his disciples, come and follow me. Come and learn from me how to live. And so these things that we see Jesus do, some of which you've already looked at in this series of Christian essentials like prayer and scripture, um, these come into place into play as ways in which we love God. Um, but it's more than just going through the motions of doing these things. It seems to me that there's like a, a quality of loving God that is a choice to believe what we read and hear and to apply that in how we see ourselves, in how we see others in the world around us, and how we interact with the world around us. And loving God also seems to me to have certain qualities of time and consistency. I mean, Jesus invites us into a life of abiding in him, letting our hearts and our minds and our souls, our decisions, our thoughts, and everything that we do, consistently and, con um, constantly and continually turn towards him <clears throat> and his desires for us and the world around us. In the illustration of the vine um, and the branches in John's gospel, Jesus says that it's abiding in him, by abiding in him, that we produce fruit. Because it's as we do this, as we take these steps towards loving God, that we become more aware of his everlasting and unchanging love for us. He wants us to know him. He wants us to, us to know his nature and his character and his ways. He wants us to know and live from a place of knowing our identity in him. And he wants us to understand that he has that desire for all humanity. And so it's in taking these steps to love him, to open our lives up to him, that we create space for him to come in and for the Holy Spirit to come and transform us into people who really know that and really live that and really reflect that in the world around us. And I think this is the reason that Jesus links these two elements of the law together. He recognizes that love for one another, love for your neighbor, flows out of having a love for God. He recognizes that love for God actually changes us into people that love others. And so the order here is actually really important. They're not separate and they're not one above the other, but you do have to love God first in order, and then the love for other people will come. The more time we spend with him, the more, time we be, the more we become like him. And as we grow more secure in knowing who he is and who we are in him, we grow in humility and compassion towards others. We can be less demanding of our own way. We can be free to give to others without expecting anything in return because we find and we know that we have everything we need in him. So it's about knowing that you're loved by God and then loving your neighbor as you yourself are loved by God, fully, sacrificially, unconditionally. And that's what I've come to understand is loving your neighbor as yourself. It's not sort of self-love, like, you know, I love myself. It's loving as you, as I myself am loved already by God. That's how I love my neighbor. But I think it's also important to recognize that, that this is a process. And I think and God himself recognizes that in our lives. It's something that we, we need to learn and to practice and to grow into. The life of following Jesus is one of like just increasing surrender, surrendering more and more of our hearts and our minds and our souls and our lives to him and allowing him to change us. And going back to 1 Corinthians, you know, love is patient, love is kind. 
God is love, therefore God is patient, God is kind. He is forgiving of us. He can bear with us and our faults and our failures along the way. He doesn't give up on us and he believes and hopes the best for us. But it is actually, it is his desire that we grow into people of love. Yes, he is forgiving and he is gracious and patient and kind, but he does desire that we grow into people of love. His desire is that we pursue love as the best way of life. Um, I watched an episode of The Chosen recently. I don't know if if any of you are aware of it or have watched any of it, but it's um, a historical drama that's based on the life and the ministry of Jesus through the eyes of the people that were with Jesus, so his disciples and other followers and people around him. And it's a drama that sort of takes the biblical narrative and it builds a bit of a backstory around the characters based on sort of the history and the culture of the time. And so it's it's a series, it's, it's excellent, but there is our artistic license um, in it. Um, and there was a scene that I watched that I think just re- really beautifully illustrated um, love. Not lo- it wasn't love in action. It was actually sort of Jesus' patience watching people trying to grow in love. But we're going to watch that clip now. And, and um, I hope you might be able to sort of identify with what, what, I, what I refer to here. But this, in this scene that we're going to watch... Um, The disciples and Jesus have set up camp and they're preparing for Jesus' big sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And you see the the disciples kind of interacting with each other just around the the campsite. Um, You see Simon the Zealot and you've got Andrew and Peter and James and John. And then, um, so you see kind of how they're they're getting on or not getting on with each other. And then it's going to cut to a conversation between Jesus and Matthew who have gone up into the mountain to kind of to prepare and to to write down what what Jesus is going to say. So let's um, watch that video clip just now. I hope you can, you can hear it, but just you'll get the gist of, of what's going on, the feel of a sense of what's going on. You're going to wake the whole camp with your chopping. Put the shirt on before the women get up. Oh, they're already up. I heard them studying in their tent. Why do the women feel so strongly about studying? Isn't it enough to just listen to our rabbi? When would they do that? He's never here. You know, your obsession with exercise? It smacks of Hellenism. I'm just trying to stay ready. What if the Romans change their mind and do what they did to your old rabbi? Can you please not bring that up? The mind and the spirit are more important than the body. How can you have a healthy mind if you don't have a healthy body? I'm talking about emphasizing one over the other. Try eating a whole bush of poisonous berries and then tell me how your mind is doing. What's with the chopping? Oh, did we interfere with sleeping in? Your sails are still full, I see. Sanctifies with his commandments and commands. Breakfast, boys. Blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe. We have plenty of wood, guys. The stack for the next travelers. Tonight is going to be our last night here. It is? Yes, Rabbi told me last night. He told everyone. Where's Matthew? He went away early this morning with Rabbi. Why does he always take Matthew? And since when did you start caring about Matthew's whereabouts? Big Thunder just does the same thing. You didn't ask about everyone else. Did you sleep okay? Uh, he was like this when I woke up. Jesus sent little James, Thaddeus, and Nathaniel ahead to find a location for the sermon. All right. Do we all know what we're supposed to do? I don't know, Simon. Maybe listen. Keep talking to me like that. I know we'll need security on all four points of the compass. We know how to execute that, Z. The crowd is going to be bigger this time, the way the word is spreading. What do we do with hecklers? Uh, The odd Pharisee used to come to these things. They used to be all over John's sermons. John would heckle them. I just said used to. Jesus can handle Pharisees. We need to get this right, huh? No mistakes. Matthew, look. Mary finished the notices. They're leaving to spread the word. I hope they can find a way to work together. What do you mean? They can't seem to agree on a single thing lately. Myself included sometimes. Oh, I've noticed. In some ways, it's to be expected. But not desired, surely? No, no. 
but it's what's bound to happen when you start something that's open to all, truly, all people. Zealots, even tax collectors. People who have been through tough times. People both hesitant and skeptical, as well as bold and confident. People hungry to learn, as well as those learned and knowledgeable. Let's get back to work. To, to pick up on some of that, but um, you know, Paul the Apostle might have been writing to this group rather than the church in Corinth. You know, Jesus followers. You don't get much more outwardly successful than a group of people that Jesus has handpicked himself to follow him. But even there, we see impatience and pride and irritation at work. But we see Jesus looking on at them, not condoning the behavior. He says it's not desirable that they're like this. But he is understanding. He's not condemning them. Um, and he's, so you see Jesus, in my mind, looking on in love, in patience, believing, and hoping for change to come in the way that they live with each other. And I think that that's how God looks on at us as we're, as we're trying to grow in that process of loving him and loving one another better. And so why do we do this? Well, I think Jesus commanded the disciples to love one another, and Paul is telling us that love is the highest way, because when we love, it's our best expression in the world of what God is. Loving God and loving others is our witness to the world, inviting them and drawing them into that community of God's love. You know, love is the greatest goal, and we make it our greatest goal by making God himself our greatest goal. It looks something like this. You know, God loves us. God already loves us. We love God, and in doing so, we open ourselves up to let God love us. And then that allows us to love others. And likely... It's going to be that they love us in return. And so that's how love is growing and being made perfect. I'd encourage you just, um, you know, maybe sometime later today, just to think of an area in your love, in your life where love is more needed. Is that your relationship towards God? Is it something in your community? Is something in this community? Is it a person in your life? And I'd encourage you to go back and read 1 Corinthians. And in place of love, say the word God. God is patient, God is kind. And just to really reflect on what does that, what does that mean? If I really believe that towards myself, towards um, that situation, towards that community, what does that mean? What does that look like? So let's pray. God, we thank you that you are patient and you are kind with us. We thank you that, um, thank you that you loved us first. Thank you that we can grow rooted in, in your love and it's by growing more rooted in your love that, that we can love the world around us. Yeah, just help us to, to love you more and help us to, to grow more aware of your love um, for us and for the world around us. And may we really take that in deep into our hearts and into our minds and into our souls and into the way that we interact with the world. May we become a blessing to the world because we love as you have loved us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have a moment now to respond and sing of that great love. Please stand with me and uh, we will sing our final song of this Sunday.
never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love. And all Julia for bringing us the word today and I hope that as you go you take that to heart both what Julia said but also the song that God's love is there it is sufficient more than sufficient to overflow into you and to flow out of you to those around you so as you go go knowing that God's love is overwhelming and powerful and reshaping that Jesus has proven that love to us. And the Spirit is that well, that living water, that geyser of love within us that fills us and that flows out of us to the world. Go and live a life of love because that is the only life worth living. God bless you all.